Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor contends that through a collaboration between MISIX and the Central Intelligence Agency, a broader narrative has been established and widely embraced, notably by senior military figures in the United States and Great Britain, with Australia and other European powers playing a lesser role. The objective appears to be maintaining a negative portrayal of Russia, especially its military. McGregor suggests there's an effort to convince Americans that the situation in Ukraine isn't as perilous as it truly is. Portraying Russia as weak and incapable, proponents hope to reduce objections to the involvement of American and European military advisors and equipment in the conflict. He believes that there is a moral and professional obligation to truthfully inform the public. However, a prevalent issue in the English-speaking world, particularly in the United States, is the habit of disparaging foreign military forces and their leaders, about whom little is known. Drawing parallels to historical instances such as the misjudgment of German and Japanese capabilities before major events like the Normandy landing and the fall of Singapore, he underscores the tendency to underestimate unfamiliar adversaries. This habit, according to him, not. New and has historical roots even among Europeans closer to Russia. He cites examples like Frederick the Great misjudging the Russians, which nearly led to the total destruction of his army. Despite historical lessons, he emphasizes that this tendency to misjudge persists, fueled in part by individuals in the federal bureaucracy and the military seeking advancement. He suggests that some may willingly provide misinformation to superiors to align with what they want to hear, leading to a collective mindset where everyone conforms to avoid standing out a phenomenon. He likens to the Abilene Paradox, the collective phenomenon known as the Abilene Paradox, where everyone conforms to avoid standing out, is a deeply ingrained and destructive influence prevalent in the U.S. military, federal bureaucracy, and possibly the intelligence community. In the context of the ongoing war, he notes that the Russians initially assembled 190,000 troops for intervention in Ukraine, but only sent 90,000 initially. Putin's misapprehension about signaling resolve led to a situation where the Russian military, initially deemed too small for the assigned mission, grew dramatically in capability over the past year. He questions the lack of evidence for the dire intent to conquer Eastern Europe before the conflict and challenges the notion that the Russians are incompetent given their effective actions against the Ukrainians. Despite having the initiative for months, the Russians have not launched a full-scale attack. He argues that Putin's assumption of a negotiated settlement or economic exhaustion forcing withdrawal might not be as straightforward as anticipated, especially given Russia's substantial logistical preparations, including the construction of extra rail lines into eastern Ukraine, suggesting potential readiness for a significant offensive towards the West. He emphasizes that the standards for individuals admitted to senior ranks in intelligence organizations are much higher compared to those for general officers. While some general officers are genuinely intelligent and well-read, the current situation differs from the past, when generals dedicated hours each night to reading relevant material and personally manage their workload. However, this practice is not prevalent now due to a lack of ability. Regarding the media's extravagant predictions and celebratory narratives about certain figures, he recalls being criticized for questioning the credibility of an individual portrayed as a heroic figure akin to Churchill. He points out that the behavior of this individual over the last year and a half has been atrocious, sending tens of thousands of his countrymen to their deaths, despite knowing from the start that victory was impossible. He sees no political rationale justifying these decisions and believes that the man is being exposed. Referring to Elon Musk's comment, he suggests that the individual in question frequently requests billions of dollars from the United States without clear accountability for the funds or equipment. Overall, he characterizes the entire situation as a fiat. He points out that everyone in the military, particularly within the officer corps, is somehow involved in corrupt practices. Battalion commanders are allegedly embezzling the salaries of soldiers under their command who have been killed in action, thereby preventing their widows from receiving compensation from the Ukrainian government. He describes Ukraine as more corrupt than Mexico, emphasizing the widespread corruption. Expressing doubt about the effectiveness of individuals like Solutionary, he believes that even if they privately tell the truth, they are ignored, silenced, or potentially coerced into compliance, possibly gunpoint. However, 
He suggests that at this stage, such revelations may not matter significantly. He highlights the foreign elements influencing operations within the Ukrainian army, contributing to the pervasive distrust between soldiers and officers. This distrust is so pronounced that squad sizes are intentionally kept small to prevent larger formations that might ribble. Characterizing the situation as terrible, he describes the people as systematically being fed into a metaphorical meat grinder. Despite documented surrenders and video footage illustrating the challenges, he expects the tragic situation to persist and possibly worsen. He criticizes the ongoing support from external sources, arguing that the place is essentially treated as the 51 state, echoing Senator Rand Paul's perspective that the U.S. is funding various aspects of Ukraine, including government salaries, bureaucracy, and the military. To an excessive extent, he acknowledges that within NATO member countries essentially follow the directives given by the United States. He candidly states that the U.S. dominates NATO, viewing it as an extension of American military power. According to him, European nations, particularly those like Great Britain, Germany, and France, have willingly positioned themselves as satellite states within the greater U.S. empire military framework. Many senior officers from these countries, while some dissenting voices exist, are portrayed as fully aligned with us interests, adopting American strategies and tactics without question. He notes that even though there are individuals like General Kayat from Germany, who speak out against perceived stupidity and acknowledge Russia as a great power, such dissenting voices are in the minority and often suppressed. The overall sentiment is described as a majority of individuals who essentially march in the direction dictated by the United States. He dismisses the possibility of a serious evaluation within NATO, stating that any attempts to question or diverge from established directives would likely result in job repercussions if one carefully considers it. He draws a comparison between the current situation and the events described in the book Anatomy of Revolution by Crane. Britain, particularly the period of Louis X. V. in 1788-1790, Strong parallels he likens Louis X. V. to the current administration, emphasizing that Louis was not inherently bad, but rather feckless and overwhelmed. He notes similarities in their responses and highlights that advisors who were neither officially appointed nor elected played a significant role in shaping decisions. Reflecting on the current administration, he expresses a sense of being directionless, akin to France before the revolution with no clear leadership or helm. He suggests that the prevailing influences on policy come from wealthy individuals like Newland, Lincoln, Sullivan, and others who shape decisions through their respective intermediaries. He underscores a critical component of the situation, highlighting that on any given day, most Americans, particularly those living in places like Kansas City, Portland, Iowa, Kansas, or Alabama, don't pay much attention to events beyond their borders. This indifference, he argues, has led to a long-standing practice of entrusting the responsibility for foreign and defense policy to those in Washington. Without asking many questions, he critiques the 